Hello, baby. Welcome to the Smart People Podcast. Sit back, grab a drink, tune in your brain. Ask not what your country can do for you. This nation will rise up. Hey everybody, welcome to Smart People Podcast. I'm Chris Stemp. And I'm John Rojas. Thanks for tuning in. Sorry about the delay. We missed, I think, a week that we normally do a weekly episode, but I am still coming off of my tequila-induced coma. I was down in Mexico for the past week on some really important business. Were you running drugs? Well, important business is what I'm going to leave it at. Okay. And so I was down there just relaxing, actually, nothing important. And it was it was pretty cool. I think Mexico gets a bad rap these days. Well, yeah. I don't know, as a whole. <laughs> I, I'd say anywhere where people get their heads <laughs> chopped off probably, you know, gets a star deducted on TripAdvisor. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But, you know, and, and we did kind of go through Nogales, which I think is ranked the number two place in Mexico not to go. So it was fun. It was a it was an adventure. Nice. But I made it back and I made it back solely to come and do this podcast. So Thanks to everyone for tuning in. We have the coolest dude on the podcast. His name is Lawrence Krauss. Many of you might have heard of him because he has an extremely popular video on YouTube called A Universe from Nothing. He does a lot of work with physics and the universe. He's kind of the epitome of smart people podcast to me. It's just somebody that I have always wanted to talk to and never thought I would because they are, and I'm not ashamed to admit it, they are above me. I mean, just to give our listeners an idea of who Lawrence Krauss is, he's an American theoretical physicist who is now a professor at Arizona State University. He's the author of a couple best-selling books, one including The Physics of Star Trek. Chris, did, were you or are you a fan of Star Trek? I'm the farthest thing from a Trekkie yeah, there could be. M- me too, but you know, I'm sure we have plenty of listeners out there who love Star Trek, so they'd probably enjoy his book. I- I've gazed up at the night sky in amazement, but that's about as far as I'd take it. Yeah, Krauss actually is one of the few living scientists that Scientific American has referred to as a public intellectual. And he's also the only physicist ever to be awarded the highest award of all three major U.S. physics societies, which to me is incredible. I didn't even know there were three physics societies in the United States. I um, guess that's the that's the beauty of it. When you get all three, you can now be crowned the man. I, I guess so. He has recently, very recently, released a new book called Quantum Man, Richard Feynman's Life in Science, which we talk about in the interview. And you can check out that book. Uh, Just go to our website, www.smartpeoplepodcast.com, and there'll be a link up there. You can read about Lawrence. He deals primarily with early universe and things like dark matter, a lot of it that's kind of outside of our grasp. But he's, as John mentioned, he's a a professor and a well-spoken individual. And I think you'll agree, he kind of breaks it down really well. But in the same time, he also blows your mind. And he talks about a bunch, you know, a bunch of interesting stuff that we're going to bring you guys momentarily. But before that, a couple of things we want to talk to you about. First, don't forget about our Amazon widget we have on our page. You go down to the bottom left-hand corner, and there's a little Amazon icon. There's a search box you can use also, but there's a little Amazon icon. Click on that. It brings you to Amazon, and anything you buy, we get a little kickback, but it's no cost to you. And it's a nice way of just supporting the podcast. It's been doing really well. I also wanted to give you guys a quick reminder to go onto iTunes, leave us a rating, a comment. It's huge how much that helps us out in getting new subscribers, new listeners. When you guys go on there and say positive things, it really does help us out. Lastly, we're, we're going to have a listener segment at the end of this one that's really interesting. So stick around for that after the interview. And we won't make you wait any longer. Here is the genius of Lawrence Krauss. Most kids at one point in their life, whether it be watching, you know, Star Wars, Star Trek, or just looking into the night sky, looking up at the stars, 
um, have thought you know a lot about science, physics, and the unknown. However, most of us leave it at that and you know just leave it at pure wonder. At what point did you become interested in physics and science? And you know, was there an epiphany well, that you like, had? One of the ways I became interested in science is by reading books by scientists and, and about scientists when I was a kid. And I remember I read a book about Galileo when I was a little kid, and it got me excited by the idea of of, of, of science and the courage required to try and understand the universe. And books by people like Albert Einstein and George Gamow. And that's one of the reasons why I write books, kind of to return the favor. And uh, I have to say that when a, when a young person comes and tells me that a book of mine caused them to become a scientist now, which has happened because some of my books are 20 years old now, um, it's an incredible gift. It's really, really a wonderful thing to know that you yeah, have influenced someone in that way. Um, my mother actually wanted me to be a doctor, and it was only in, in high school that I, I guess I, she, she told me doctors were scientists. And I got interested in science, and then I discovered in high school, I guess, that being a doctor wasn't the same thing as being a scientist. And um, uh, I guess by then I was already hooked on science. Do you think that when it comes to science, the American education system is failing our, our children? Well, it, it, it's failing many children. I think the good kids do very well, uh, but they generally do well in any system, I guess. We don't do a good job of teaching science because you've got to understand in certain uh, – if you look at the public school system – in this country, in especially middle school science, say, a large percentage, 80 to 90 percent of those teachers don't have a training in science. And so they're, they're uncomfortable with science, and they're conveying that to the students. And uh, we, have to, we have to work on that. We have to get people who are more comfortable teaching science in the classroom. But the problem is that people with a science background tend to be able to get jobs elsewhere, and we don't, teach our, we don't pay our teachers enough. And so it's a sort of chicken and egg problem, I think. But the other thing is we're, we're, we're so bent on teaching kids facts that we don't really teach in the process of science. That's really, if, I, if you ask me what kids, what I really want kids to understand, I don't care if they understand all the, the facts of, of science because they'll, they'll get a lot of that later on. I want them to understand how we question the world, how to tell, the, how to tell something is false, uh, how we distinguish truth from, from nonsense. Those are things that are useful, and they're also going to be useful to, to them the rest of their lives, and it's one of the great gifts of science. Uh, I think we spend more time... Uh, on, on process, experience, and joy, and having fun instead of being uncomfortable. And it's a big problem. I mean, it's, it's easy to say what the problems are. It's harder to think of solutions. One of the ways we, I've advocated, and we're trying to do this through the Origins Project, is to teach science around questions rather than answers. Kids get this idea that, you know, science was done 200 years ago by dead white men. And it's not the way it is. It's an ongoing thing. And the same questions that were happening then, in many ways, are happening now. There's lots of exciting, unknown mysteries about the universe that relate to the very things that people are interested in. How did we get here? Where are we going? Where did I come from? What's the universe made of? Is there life elsewhere? The kind of questions that kids are excited about, but they don't think of them as they, you know, they learn about sliding down inclined planes or, or something boring. And so th they don't realize that those exciting questions are, are not only science, but things that they can address and they can actually understand. And I think you know, if, we, if we work more towards a, that, we, we do everyone a, a, a service. You know, that was actually a, a thought slash question I had for you earlier was just that, do you think that it's because to many kids, science seems so, so difficult to grasp that they, they eventually just kind of give up on it and take something that's easier to go with? Well, yeah, I mean, that's a part of the problem too. And in fact, one of the things I once, I once said when there was the big financial cr crisis and crash a few years ago is it was the one good thing that would come out of it is all the good students wouldn't be going into finance. Because you got all these kids who are saying, look, I can go to become an investment banker on Wall Street with, frankly, not needing to know a lot. I have to work long hours, but, I, but there's not the same intellectual baggage required to be able to do it. Why should I, why should I take a degree in engineering or science, which, which requires a fair amount of input, and then I'll earn you know, a fair living but when I can you know, make a killing on Wall Street? And so I think um, it is true that, 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 uh, that there is more of an investment required in a number of these fields. And, but I think that, that, that uh, we've also divorced science of culture, that somehow we don't think of, of science as, as something that a cultured person should know. And it's unfortunate. So even the good students, many of them say, oh, I'm, you know, my brain doesn't work that way. I don't want, need to know any science. And unfortunately, we let that go. But we wouldn't, if they didn't know anything about Shakespeare, we wouldn't call them cultured. And, and so uh, I think there's this fact that, let's face it, there are 
certain thresholds. And of course, there's some mathematics required and a lot of science. And, but there's a lot you can understand without that. And, and I think we want to ask ourselves, what should an educated person know? Someone who's you know, not going to be a scientist. And we tend to try and, unfortunately, teach physics and other things as if we're trying to clone scientists, but we're not. We're just trying to get people who may never do science again in their lives some appreciation. And if we change that, then we'll change what we, our expectations for what we need them to know. And, it, and we can do a lot of fun things without mastering things. You don't have to master all of science. And you know, that's what I think of when I think of, that's one of the reasons people aren't interested in science. They say, well, you know, I, it's too hard. But the, the point is that you don't have to, you tend to think you have to be a scientist to understand and appreciate science. But we don't say you have to be a, a, a musician to, under, to enjoy music or a painter to enjoy art. You, you know, we basically say, look, you, without being an expert, you can appreciate it and enjoy it. And I'd, I'd like more of that for science. For those that aren't aware, you base a lot of your your works and everything around, and you you specialize, I think, in creation of the Earth and the early universe and things like that. Well, yeah, well before the Earth, yes. Okay, correct. And you have fought to keep evolution as part of the curriculum in school. Does it bother you that perhaps this is just my opinion, but parents and teachers oftentimes neglect teaching kids about the early universe? and an evolution, but they have no problem teaching their kids about the, the religious aspect of how we came to be here and, and man and the creation of the earth. Oh, of course, it's ridiculous. It's just, it's, just, it's just ludicrous. There was a recent study that just came out you know, that said that I think it was only 20% of high school teachers teach evolution as the basis of modern biology in spite of the fact that they're supposed to. And, and it's just, it's, it's a tragedy. It's one of the most beautiful scientific and significant scientific ideas that's ever been developed, and it describes life on Earth and helps us understand an incredible amount. And um, we, and, and the fact that we turn our backs on it is, is just literally a tragedy. Of course it upsets me. It's one of the reasons I spend a lot of time trying to defend it, mostly because people miss out. It's just people miss out on the, on the beauty of the universe by being afraid of, of reality. And, and, and if they are afraid of reality, how can we expect to compete as a nation you know, against a, a, a world of people who are, be, who are technologically literate if we take our kids and, and try and keep them illiterate, scientifically illiterate anyway? You mentioned the beauty of the universe. I don't think that you know, many people truly understand just how big the universe is and how you've explained before that the universe is expanding can you go into a little bit about what you've said there on the expansion and just how big the universe is? Well, I mean, the universe is so large that, uh, that the most amazing things happen all the time, even if they're extremely rare. You know, stars explode once per 100 years per galaxy. Uh, you know, and, the, and, and as I've often said, every atom in your body comes from a star. In fact, many stars, the atoms in your left hand might come from a different star than your right hand. Because in order to get in your body, all those elements are made in stars. So every atom in your body has experienced the most cataclysmic explosion in nature, a supernova. But there's so many stars that there's more than one happening every second in the universe. There's 100 billion stars in our galaxy. There are over 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. It's almost unfathomable. As a result, and the universe is about 14 billion years old, and therefore it's you know, almost 30 billion light years across. That means when we look at objects that are 10 billion light years away, we're looking at the light that was emitted 10 billion years ago. That's 5 billion years before our sun even formed. It's amazing, and because of that vastness, the most incredible things can happen. The universe is so big, as I say, that even the rarest, most unexpected things are happening all the time as we look out. Which, and every time we open a new window on the universe, we're surprised and enlightened. And it's just an amazing place. And what saddens me is that, is that the, the excitement of the real universe is so much more exciting than the myths people purvey about, about the universe. It, it, that it, if people just understood what was going on and saw the pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope and of, of the kind of things that are going on, it would, it, the things that are beyond the wildest dreams of humans are happening all the time. How did we come to the, I guess, uh, you know, realization of how, how old the universe is, how old the Earth is? Well, I mean, there's lots of independent ways to determine the age of the universe. One of the simplest ways is that the universe is expanding. And if you work backwards and ask how fast it's expanding and work backwards, you come out with a universe which is sort of 10 to 15 billion years old. But, you know, if you've been going between Phoenix and Tucson and you're traveling 60 miles an hour and you've gone two hours, well, you know, uh, you do have 120 miles, you travel 120 miles. So if I measure your car traveling 60 miles per hour and I see you're 120 miles away, I can say you've been traveling for two hours. 
Well, we do that with galaxies. We can measure their speed. We see how far away they are, and we know how long it took them to get there from the Big Bang. It's sort of one rough way. And, and 